it is now. We're going to spend three, 39 minutes and 58 seconds talking about the wonderful world of SVG. It's going to be amazing. My goal is to get you excited about SVG and stuff. Maybe I'll not stand right in front of it, although I like to pace a little bit. Uh, uh, I work on a, on a pretty cool app called CodePen, and there's going to be a bunch of CodePen demos and stuff in here just because that's exciting and fun, and I like showing off other people's work. SVG is a language. It's built with angle brackets and attributes and values between those things and stuff. It looks a little bit familiar to our friend... HTML, they're both kind of XML, right? But in HTML land, the tags are divs and spans and things that make sense for documents, whereas in SVG, the elements are slightly different. There are rectangles and ellipses and things for drawing and things to affect drawings, but they're familiar and they're fun. They hang out together and that type of thing. Let's look at a little bit of syntax for context. So you know what we're talking about here, how SVG works. It's not particularly complicated. In fact, of all that, you know, like if you're writing HTML, there's like, you, you don't have to like have a cheat sheet of elements next to you usually, because you kind of just know what to use. Like a SVG is kind of that same way. There's not so many elements that it's hard to memorize. The important ones that you need are not even memorized, because it's kind of rare that you actually have to write them yourself. But the point is, there's just not that many. In fact, for the shapes that do drawing in SVG, that's all of them really. There's really not that many. It's lines and rectangles and circles and ellipses. Polyline is a polygon that's just not closed. And then paths are fun because they can draw anything. They have their own kind of special syntax. Pretty cool little element there. Let's look at a little bit of syntax. Uh, uh, pretty easy to understand. The dashed area there will be the SVG context that we're working in. It'll be an SVG tag around this rectangle. But uh, there's an X and a Y coordinate, which is kind of the where it lives. You know, that's 10-10 that's right there, sure. And then it has a width and a height, and, that, and those are equal, so that's why it's a square. And we've drawn a, we've drawn a, a circle that's filled with yellow and struck. So it's pretty easy to understand. It's just some attributes on XML elements, and you've kind of syntactically declared a rectangle. Pretty nice there. Circles work the same way. There's uh, an X and Y coordinate and a radius involved, and it draws a circle there. So pretty kind of, pretty kind of easy to understand. Uh, system there. There's x, y points, that, and then that's how a polygon works, is just x, y points, and it draws a shape between them. You can kind of draw anything. It's, it doesn't take too much of a stretch of imagination to understand that you could, with those tools, draw a beaker freaking out. There's just circles and polygons and stuff, you know, like the tools are there. If you can draw rectangles and circles and stuff and fill them with colors, you can draw a lot. Those are the kind of the tools of art. There's a, these are the little electricity things are polylines, unclosed polygons and stuff. The, 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 the tools are kind of there. A little bit more syntax, you could declare a gradient. That's how it's uh, uh, done in, in SVG. It's a, little, it's a little wordy maybe, per, a little bit compared to, to CSS, but it's not too bad. There's actually a gradient element. That doesn't draw anything at all by itself. You're just kind of declaring this gradient in which to kind of apply to other elements later. We've given it an ID here, uh, 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 and this is like a fancy designer gradient where it fades to like green to like slightly different green to slightly different green just so it's perfect. <laughs> and there, <clears throat> it's an ellipse and we'll draw the ellipse and we'll fill it with a reference to that gradient and it's a gradient with a fancy green thing on it, right? We can take, because it's been declaratively defined, we can then draw something else. We'll have a path element with a bunch of funny numbers in there, but that, you know, remember path can kind of draw anything. In this case, we drew a little leaf and we filled it with green and we were able to refer to the same gradient that we've already defined. So that's kind of the syntactical declarative nature of SVG that's kind of cool. With those tools now, so you can draw any shape, you can fill it with any color, you can stroke it uh, with any color, There's, you can do all the, the, all the tools of art are there, it's not too much of a stretch of imagination to think that you could just wah, do anything, you know, art, <laughs> I have all the tools, that's, that's, all the, that's all you can do in any kind of visual languages, draw shapes and fill them with colors, maybe, I guess texture we don't have, but. That's about it in SVG. So uh, this particular image in the background, though, there's kind of limits to the practicalities of SVG in that way. I happen to, that's one that comes with like Illustrator when you buy it. It's like, look at the cool shit Illustrator can do. But it's like, a le as SVG, it's like 11 megabytes. It was just weird territory for SVG. I mean, it came as a .ai AI files, whatever. But you would probably not use that in SVG format on the web because it's like impractically large. And the whole point of SVG is the web, really. I mean, there, you might like argue for some archival reasons why it exists, but uh, uh, it's a vector format for the web. It was born for the web. It was specced out by web people to be used on websites. So uh, what's kind of interesting about that is there's no, there's no, it doesn't inform 
enforce any particular like performance limits or anything, but there's certainly files that like totally definitely should be SVG on your websites. Totally definitely shouldn't be SVG on your websites, like that weird whatever that was happening in that one. And then and then like gray in between, right? Of ones that are like uh, probably should be SVG, but maybe not, or how do I guess? So well, I thought we'd cover like the obvious spectrum and then talk about the middle gray area a little bit using your grandmother as a guide. This picture of your grandmother, I can just tell is like 80 bytes, you know? It's like a, t it's like a, couple, of a couple of elements, just a little bit of code that it would take to draw that in SVG with the stroke. It's super minimal code, uh, and it will render per like it is now, render perfectly well uh, on a website. So that's kind of in the like definitely category. Like if that's the image you're trying to use in your website, that is like SVG town, definitely use that. Then as we move into the middle ground territory, there's like maybe like kind of cartoony stuff, like this vision of your grandmother here is like in that gray area, kind of. Like it's, an, it's complex enough that the file size compared to the PNG version of it is like, yeah, I don't even know. So when you're in this kind of territory, which we'll talk a little bit more as we move on, you should probably be comparing the zipped file size of it compared to cool. The zipped size of the of the of the of the JPEG version of it to be kind of to be kind of fair about it and, it, and then you have to make choices like is it are you am I displaying it that big on the website and it needs to look super crisp or am I shrinking it down to like avatar size and there's like 12 of them there's like decision making that you have to to do there uh, file size being one of them and comparing the the gzip file size of the SVG which we're going to look at in a minute this version of your grandma it's, it's raster it's pixel by pixel. Uh, there's no there's no reason for uh, that to be SVG. SVG is an, it's a it's a cool file format. It's useful for lots of things. Raster not really being one of them, unless it's like weird clown car stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that was a best cackle ever. So nope. <clears throat> cool. This would be like maybe in the in the maybe category, right? It's pretty complicated. SVG could totally handle it. It looks beautiful, but it's fairly complicated. It would probably be a pretty big SVG file, but. It moves, which puts it firmly in the SVG category, because that's awesome. Uh, and the SVG has great animation tools. We'll talk about that uh, as we move forward a little bit here. Uh, as someone who looks at a lot of demos on CodePen, occasionally I'll see something like this, where it's really cool. You're like, nice, you made an icon of an SNES controller. That looks awesome. Uh, it does look awesome. Cool little experiment. Wouldn't take that away from anybody. Uh, although you do look at the code, and in this particular case, it was just div town, right? Which is cool and clever and interesting. You can take, we've, <laughs> we've talked about this many times, you can take a rectangle and apply border radius to it and absolutely position it and rotate it and you can make this happen with divs, and there's nothing really wrong with that from an experimental perspective, other than that it was probably kind of hard to do that, and it probably would have taken like 10 seconds in Illustrator to draw the things and just export it as SVG, and then it would have been an SVG file, which is semantically appropriate thing. It has more design possibilities to it. There's more places you can take it. There's more animation that could be done to it in an easier way. So uh, this kind of drawing with div stuff is weirdly common and should be just play with SVG kind of thing. Not to mention, there's tools to do it. Like, like I said, you could probably draw that uh, uh, without too much skill in something like Illustrator fairly quickly, and Illustrator speaks SVG very well. It's a native file format of Illustrator, which is great. So I think here's just me smurfing around in, in, in there just to, just to prove that, like, look, it's made from points, and you can move things and rotate them and crop them and remove other garbage and stuff. I probably should have made this video so long and boring. But I think the, the point is I get to a point where I'm saving it because I need, I need an SVG file in which to use and the drop down menu has SVG as a format. It's not just, you don't just export to, uh, you know, it's not like you have a PSD and you're like, I'm going to temporarily make a JPEG, but I need to keep the PSD around because otherwise it won't be editable. The, AI, the, the SVG in Illustrator can be saved as a... Uh, as SVG in a kind of fully editable uh, kind of way. And we'll, we'll get a little bit in, more into that later and kind of what you should and shouldn't do there. I think I might even have this kind of, this is like one of those like major dialogues that you're confronted with when you do that. That's like, holy buckets, is there a lot of uh, things in there? Uh, ah! SVG. <laughs> SVG 1.1 is the kind of the correct choice there. This is the thing, like let's say you have type in an SVG file. It says like, Chris. 
okay? And then that's editable, so I can click into it and like change the letters to something else. It remains editable text. But then like in SVG, there's an actual element called text, and that's kind of great because the text remains editable, selectable, indexable, searchable, findable, whatever text actually in the SVG document, which is great, and it's really tiny and efficient that way, but it's subject to the fonts that are available in the document that you put it in. So if you use like cool Gotham or whatever designers are using these days, Gotham light. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can't like you can't just use that. The text it won't. It'll be in Times New Roman or whatever the default is, right? Unless you happen to be load that at font face font and use it. But if you're like, but I really want to use Gotham light on it, you can like convert all the stuff to outlines. I'm sure you've done that before. It's not really type anymore. It's just a vector shape. of This will just kind of do that on the fly for you. That's what that one is. Uh, it's just kind of convenient when you save it. This, this is an important one, the preserve illustrator editing capabilities. That's like if you like guides, you know, you can drag in the little blue bastards from the side and they left for lining stuff up. That's data that goes into a file. And uh, you would maybe expect that the next time you open that file that they would be there. Uh, but that's stuff that's got to be in there. If you save it in SVG format, there's no SVG element for a guide. It's just crap that gets thrown in there. I don't even know what it looks like in the file, but it's there, totally useless for the web. So it's tempting to like turn that off so that you, uh, it's not there because it doesn't need to go across the pipes of the internet. That would be kind of useless information. Uh, maybe just leave it on though, because the, the, like it's tempting to do your like get some optimization of SVG going here, but it's like nah, maybe not. Like there's probably a build step that will do most of the optimization. So you might as well kind of leave this file as like nice as it can be with your guides and your precision and stuff, and then do the optimization stuff later. Maybe that's up for debate. Uh, that's the only right answer to that one. Let's cruise through this. Uh, UTF-8, duh, the whole web. Responsive's a good. Checkbox there, you'll get a viewport if you leave that checked, which is good. That's a boring slide. Let's move on. There's tools in Photoshop for vector editing stuff too that you may or may not be aware of. Uh, one of them is like if you kind of, if you like right click on, on a, that's like a vector, that's a shape layer in Photoshop, right? You can kind of go, f if that layer is selected, you can go file or you can go click, right click on the thing and go extract assets from the flyout menu. Now you get this weird export screen that has it cropped to that logo and you can be like, I want a PNG version of it, I want an SVG version of it, I want a 2X version of it, a 3X version of it, and just hit export and it'll give you all those pieces, which is kind of nice for web design people. I don't know if you've used extract assets, but it's actually like, outputs pretty decent SVG cropped, ready to use right from Photoshop, which is kind of cool. Uh, and it's, you know, it's ready to rock. It actually has some of the best SVG export that I've seen. A lot of, even like good kind of SVG, even Sketch like puts a bunch of like metadata garbage in the file. You're like, cool, thanks. I'm sure my users will love that, digging into that view source. Generated in 0.42 seconds. Thanks. Sketch is pretty good though. Uh, <laughs> Uh, sketch is good. Any element you like click on in Sketch, whether it's a group or whatever, I don't know how many people use Sketch. Sketch is great, but the, yes, nice. I saw a tweet the other day that was pretty funny about Sketch. There was like a, a guy like fell down a well or something and he's like, help, and a designer walks by and he's like, you haven't switched to Sketch yet? <laughs> so you can, click, you can click on stuff and then you click make exportable. And you get the same, same kind of stuff where you could be like, I want the SVG version of it, I want a PNG version, I want a 2X version of it, I want a 4X version of it, whatever. You just tell Sketch what you want. We'll zoom in on that. Like that's, this, is com this is good for that responsive images stuff. If, you're, if, you're, if you, you're like, okay, I get it, source set, 2X, 3X, like how do I generate those versions? Well, you just you put the high res one in Sketch, get it to the size that you want it, say I want the 1X, the 2X, the 3X, whatever, just hit export and It'll throw them in, and now, now you have all those versions for source set to use. This is part of that workflow, kind of. So that's pretty useful. For the SVG portion of it, uh, you, could, you would use Picture, because Picture has a way to do, to do media type fallback stuff, which is pretty good. So yeah, <laughs> throw them back. Yeah, he likes it. <laughs> he loves that stuff. Uh, great. So that's what, like, the syntax would like for Picture if you, uh, uh, if you have a 
you'd have a source that points to the SVG file, and if it fails, then it, then it will kind of fall back to the, the PNG stuff, and that's how you would use that. The problem with that kind of is that picture element, any, any browser that supports picture certainly supports SVG as well, so it's not really that useful unless you use a polyfill for picture, which is great, because there's a really good one called picture fill. But in order for picture fill to really like do its thing and be efficient, you can't have image source. It will the browser will find that with the prefetcher thing we learned about, and it will download it anyway. So this isn't this isn't all that useful unless you use picture fill and kill the source part, kind of move that down into source set, which is fine. It's just invalid, and then locks you into using picture fill forever, which is maybe fine because picture fill is cool. But just know that like this isn't maybe the, always the perfect way to to kind of handle that. We'll talk about more fallback techniques for SVG. Uh, later. So now you have some SVG, we made it in Illustrator, we found it on the web, whatever. We have something.svg and we intend to use it. There's a whole bunch of ways to use it on the web. I think there's pretty much only three that are, are, are useful in any way. One of them is just to put it as the source of an image tag. That's the kind of the easiest way. One of them is the background image in CSS, which is cool. And one of them is, is inline SVG. The other one's being objects and embeds and iframes and stuff. And of all the years I've worked with SVG, I've never done that. So whatever, go away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have an image tag and we're going to just point it to an SVG file. You can do that. If an anybody didn't know that, now you do. And that's, a, I think, a kind of an excellent takeaway. It works just great for the most part. Uh, the, con the, the, the use case for that is images that belong in content. They're part of a blog post or a page or they live in CMS or somewhere. They're not really part of the design of the page. They're part of the content that goes there. If it's part of the design of the page, it's kind of CSS territory. Anyway, so there's, the, there's a blog post. It's got a cheesy thing, bah, box, border box is cool. Uh, it lives there. It lives in the RSS feed that I read for it. It goes out to, it, this gets put into an email that goes out to people. The image will show up fine in the email. Images are, are perfect for that. SVG is a, is a great use case there. Uh, if, if the image is vectory and small and fits into the definitely category and all that stuff, yes, it works uh, in email for the most part. If not, use an alt tag, good enough. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, this is how you use it, and it's just you, just you use it in the same way you would use JPEG, GIF, ping, whatever. You just put it in the background with the URL thingy, and there it is. This would be like a use case for that. It's an ad. There's people in the background. That's totally vectory. That's going to look great. Uh, an SVG, no matter how you do background size, you could do, for example, background size cover or whatever it is, which just unabashedly resizes it. It doesn't care to make sure that it fills whatever the element is. That would be kind of dangerous maybe in, with, when you're using raster, because like, what if it makes it bigger? It might look like crap. Doesn't matter. An SVG will resize, and it will look good doing it. Uh, this is what inline SVG looks. Remember our friend, the rectangle? I need to not step on that. Uh, it can just be in a HTML document, and it will draw the rectangle right in the document, which is pretty great. Now I have drawing tools right in HTML. Uh, what's kind of nice about that is those other two ways that we just looked at, it's referencing a .svg file that it has to traverse the internet to go get and then come back, which is fine because that's how the internet works, except for that when you're looking at making web pages more performant, the less times you have to do that, faster your website, which is great. So this doesn't have to go anywhere. All the instructions for drawing it are right in the document, uh, which is good for speed, and it's good because it's like in the DOM, and you can control it with CSS, and you can attach event handlers to it. You can do anything that you would, could do with a div, I think, maybe even more, I don't know. Uh, so let's think those, those three ways that I think are important. Here's a fictional website about donuts to demonstrate such. Uh, Cool. So it's not like they're all interchangeable ways. You'd probably reach for them in different circumstances. I would say that the donuts themselves, I could see being content that like goes out to an email or is generated by a CMS. It's like these are like posts almost. I could see that making sense to be like this is content that's going on the page that is going to go elsewhere too. That's a fine use case for SVG as image. There's the little purple wavy things that are part of the design of the site. That makes sense that it would be in CSS. SVG be used that way. We could size it, we could do stuff that way. And then there's like the logo, and then there's like the add to cart buttons have a little cart, those are vector. I would say that inline SVG makes sense for that because we can build a system to do that, and we're gonna do that uh, soon, I think, if not next. Uh, I thought we'd just interject a little thing, like can we talk about why SVG at all? The obvious one is resolution independence. SVG will always look as good as they possibly can on any screen, despite it's how you size it or what pixel density the screen is and stuff. It doesn't matter. They're made from math. 
they'll look fine. Uh, that's probably the most compelling way because we, you know, responsive raster graphics are a pain in the ass and it's just, you know, just don't even have to worry about an SVG. You have a, a vector graphic, it's just one less thing on the <laughs> things to worry about list that we all have. I have one. Uh, there's a, <laughs> the, well, another cool reason is that you can use SVG as a system. We looked at the syntax and how it's declarative and programmatic and stuff. That's like a pretty compelling reason to use SVG. Computers can do cool stuff with it, so that's cool. Uh, and all the design possibilities like animation and controlling it through CSS and that type of thing is pretty, I mean, the list could go on farther, but those are some pretty compelling reasons to look for it. This is the most, like, typical cliche conference graphic ever. Like, there's different size screens these days. Have you thought about that? That's a, I have a phone right here in my pocket. And the, so anyway, but, if, but it's kind of true, and SVG eliminates some of that problem. You can put SVG on it anywhere and uh, it will look as good as it can look, which is kind of great. Um, I think I have a, a sound for this one, but this was like kind of the year that the smart people that decided SVG should be a thing. I'm gonna do, rock, the, rock the modem sound, a little slow. Cool, that's like the environment that the SVG was. <laughs> was invented in, and it was a low bandwidth time, and we knew it, you know? Everything sucked then, kind of. Uh, not really. The Matrix was that year, uh, but <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, but it's, we knew that it took a long time. It was that was definitely even to this day. The, the network is the bottleneck, but it was really the bottleneck then. That sucked, you know. Uh, so we did, we uh, uh, the, the, it was born in this fire of like let's send like instructions on how to draw something instead of the thing that's already been drawn because we can the computer is more powerful than it. Go. You fucker. <laughs> I'm not saying anything else. Ah, no. Yeah, cool. Yeah, this was like the graphic that supported what I just said, which is why send pixels when you can send math? It was good, I thought. I think those are good slides. Uh, nice, so yeah, why send pixels when you can send geometry? Because math is more efficient, let the, let the, let, let the computer uh, do the drawing, which is interesting, because I think we had, uh, 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 we had Mr. Tom Dale actually on a podcast where he was talking about MVC frameworks and Ember and how like it's a big payload, but once it comes down to your computer, it's a lot more efficient. What goes across the network wires in an MVC world is like less, and it's like let the computer do more and the network do less, which is kind of thing, uh, which is interesting parallel, right? It's the same kind of uh, concept. Come on, buddy. There you go. Does the thing and he bounces. Cool. He would agree with me that SVG similar, different concepts. This is like big thought stuff. Tweetable maybe. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about SVG uh, efficiency a little bit. Uh, SVG is already very efficient because it's instructions on how to draw something. So like that by nature is a pretty efficient thing. But because of the file format and the nature of it, it can be like even more efficient, which is pretty great. For example, it gzips super well. Gzips is just something you like tell your server to do, and it does it for you for the most part if you've configured it correctly. Um, there's a little bit of code to do that. It's mod deflate and stuff, not something to write down. But this one is like make sure that you serve it in the right file format because occasionally servers are weird about that. And then while you're at it, gzip it on its way out, you'd probably be gzipping a lot of stuff, but see how it matches the file format there? Yeah, mod deflate, it's pretty good stuff. This is a cool video, like kind of to understand how gzip works. This is how gzip works on a poem. Uh, which is cool. So once upon a midnight dreary, yeah. And any in the and and when it comes across some text that's already been printed, that like kind of collapses into nothing. It just turns into a pointer of where that text has previously appeared, kind of thing. So anything that's read kind of like gets collapsed in the kind of final file. So as the as the poem goes on, more and more of it becomes. Uh, Code that you know will kind of not be there in the in the in the final thing. It's just the block that's that you know you get. I'm not very good at explaining it, but the the <laughs> look at that that appeared somewhere else. That's amazing. 
Uh, anyway, so gzip is really efficient. Can you imagine how, G, how, 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 how it is in an SVG file? It's not a friggin' poem with fancy words in it. It's like rect, 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 x equals, x equals, x equals, angle brackets all over the place. It's super repetitive, so gzip eats the crap out of it. It's rid of gzipping incredibly well. So that's just gzipping. And then it can also be optimized, like, like, the, the, like imagine a polygon where it's at like, 1.872 and 4.378 or whatever, like does it need that much decimal precision? We could probably like chop off some de decimal precision. We can remove white space, so we can remove comments, we can remove proprietary crap. There's like a lot of optimization that can happen like heuristically kind of. Uh, and that's what SVGO does. This is just the, the graphical version of SVGO. There's a bunch of versions of it. We drag grandma on there and we get 20 20%, presumably without it looking any differently than it did before. So it's very compressible just with that, then with gzip, then the fact that it's efficient anyway. It's like it's a super efficient format for the web, kind of great. Cool, let's talk about icon systems a bunch, because I think that's like a hot, cool thing, or I've decided it is a hot, cool thing in SVG land. A lot of websites need icon systems, but a ton of you work on sites that have one. Here's github.com. They make, there's like a few places on their site where they use icons, I was able to identify a handful of them where they need it, where they just, they've decided to opt for an icon. Um, uh, no judgment there. The point is that like, if each, each one of these was like image source equals gear.svg or whatever, that would be a whole heck of a lot of HTTP requests. We already covered that that's kind of bad news for the web, so uh, we reduce the, the, if we could smash all those into one request, that would be kind of great for performance. It would be a nice system. Let's build a system. Uh, we've been building systems like that for, for kind of a long time. Yeah, that's, that's the deal. It's 20 requests, very slow. So in our system, uh, we, want all the, we want to smush all the icons into one request. That would be nice for performance. And then just make it easy on us. Give us some tools to, to kind of make it uh, not so hard as a front-end developer. We solved this problem in the past with, with, with sprites, and we had creative solutions for that. You could hand code them. You could use tools to build them. This is the same problem with the same solution. Smash all the things into one request, serve them somehow. We solved the same thing with icon fonts. It was like that, you know, it's like, that's a system, it's somewhat easy to use, and we've smashed all the icons into one file. We're solving the same problem here. Uh, I'm gonna solve it again with SVG and what I think is kind of the best way to do it, probably for the future. As a quick aside, the things that we're gonna talk about are probably not gonna be super important in HTTP2. I don't know what the timeline is. I'm sure there's smarter people in this room for that, but I think the idea is that there's not as much penalty for requesting multiple files from the same host in the future, and it might be better not to do this, but I wouldn't like wait for that necessarily. I don't know what the timeline is, but for now, let's keep smashing stuff together. It's pretty good for performance. So here's, we're gonna use inline SVG to, to pull this off, and this is gonna be our, our little odyssey here. This is how SVG works. There's an opening and closing tag, right? We're gonna put some drawing elements inside of it. Let's say the top one draws the Twitter bird or something, and the bottom one draws the code pen logo, which is a thing, and then the other element is the circle. There's, you can put whatever you want in here. Lots of shapes, lots of stuff, gradients, whatever you want. Then around each, each icon, we're going to put, uh, for now, a G tag. And a G tag doesn't mean anything in SVG. It's just like a div. It's just a generic wrapping element. It's group. Uh, and it's just convenient for, like, the cascade, you know, kind of re referencing a group of things together for styling reasons or, or whatever. Uh, we're going to put that in a defs tag in SVG. That means I'm just defining this stuff to use later. I'm not going to, don't draw it right now. Uh, we're, for now, we're going to drop it right in the document, right in an HTML document. Uh, we're going to make sure that SVG doesn't render because the, even though defs won't draw this stuff, an SVG element still takes up space. So let's squish it to nothing. You might even want to kick it off the page, something like that with CSS. Uh, and then when we want to draw that shape, we use the use tag. It's a new one we're looking at in this funky looking attribute, the xlink href attribute. And we're going to put with the value of it, the identifier that points to one of those g tags with all the drawing shapes inside of it. And that will work wherever this appears in our document. It will draw that icon, which is useful. So it's like we've set up all the icons we want to draw, and then we just sprinkle this in our document wherever we want to draw it. So it's kind of the basis of an icon system, which is great. In this case, we've put them in some anchor links, we've put it in some things, uh, uh, put some, some words next to, those, next to those shapes. That's the old school design of CSS Tricks did that. It was just drawn in SVG and then use, 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 use. 
fill orange, fill red, fill blue, whatever. I just drew a tab once and I used it over and over and over and I was able to draw that shape, which would be pretty hard to draw exactly as is in CSS with the outro would be pretty difficult to pull off probably. Uh, cool, yeah, so that, that, that's how those tabs work, but certainly it could be just like a little cabin next to the word home or whatever, and the more traditional use for, for SVG icons. But let's level up this a little bit. Let's make it a little better. If we can, we're going to do some things to it. We're going to use the symbol element instead of G symbol is perfect for it. It's kind of, that's the whole purpose that exists in SVG is to, you know, have a thing that you can reference and use later. We're going to use a build tool, make our computer do some work for us, because that's what they're for. And we're going to Ajax for that file, which we'll get to in a second. That's efficient because we can then cache it uh, instead of dropping it in the document. And then we're going to deal with all the fallback stuff. So this is going to be the, the final little journey we go on. First, we just looked at some code. So it's my chill out slide. Cool. Let's get into it, though. This is what we used to do. We have the G, and then what, later, when we want to use it, we have to actually do a little bit more work. We have to bring a view box with us to set up the context that that drawing was in. We have to put, that's not even, that's a bare minimum for accessibility. You probably have to put some ARIA roles on it and title tags and stuff. And it, actually, where you draw the icon is a little bit more robust than what I just showed. You have to kind of do all that stuff. But let's, let's replace it for, with a symbol tag. You don't really need def. Symbols don't draw automatically. You could leave it in there. That doesn't really matter. The, the symbol tag, and this one, we're going to put the view box, which is the, the, the context in which the shapes are drawn, uh, is on there. The ar correct ARIA labels are on there. The correct uh, uh, title and description and stuff is right there. Now, later, when we go to use it and draw it in our document, we don't have to have a view box. All the ARIA stuff just comes along for the ride. It just gets plucked up and put in here instead. Uh, and it just becomes easier to use, so like that's kind of the way to do it. And if we could have a computer build that thing for us, that would be great because the implementation then is super easy. So this is kind of what we actually want. This is the final output file that we want. It's just an SVG, and then symbol, 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 symbol. Just the, each one of these is a, a, an icon that we intend to use. Our logo, the Twitter bird, whatever it ends up being. That's what the kind of final production output is going to look like, although the white space and stuff would probably be removed. We're going to make that to a defs file, or call it whatever you want, icons, sprites, whatever. We, we're one file is the output. That's the one thing we're hoping to be our whole icon system. Uh, and we'll make the computer do it, a tool for that. One of them is Ico Moon. That's a pretty cool one. It's like, I want this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Click, click, click. They can be your own ones that you upload. They can be from other sets or whatever. You click download, you get this little folder. Uh, stuff to check out. We're going to open that folder, probably. Uh, and it gives you all of them individually, which is nice, but it also gives you this file. What is it? SVG, symbol, 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 symbol. So it's a build tool. It's a web-based one, but it gives you what we're talking about. That's the output that we're looking for. That's like a production icon file ready to use. And then whenever you want to use it, you go SVG, use Xlink href icon headphones, and you can draw the icon right there. It's great. Um, there's grunt ones, there's gulp ones, whatever. Here's, here's a grunt one. We'll look at a little workflow of a grunt setup with this thing going on. So we have a folder full of SVG files. Each one draws its own little unique icon. In this case, it's the cart. We have grunt watch set up to watch the folder full of those SVG files. When one of them changes, is up, updated, deleted, removed, added, whatever. Grunt will trigger some things. It's going to trigger one that optimizes the SVG files, and then it's going to run one called SVG Store, which is the one that smashes them all together in that file. So here I'm, I'm in Illustrator. I'm changing the color of the card. I'm going to remove its wheels. So I'm just making a change, and I'm going to hit Save. And then when Grunt Watch runs, it's going to run all its tasks and immediately refresh the browser, and all of the icons have been changed. So it's like once you have this workflow set up, it's pretty great. I'm just working with the individual icons, and as soon as I hit Save, they're optimized. They're smashed into a new defs file, the browser is refreshed. It's a pretty nice, pretty nice workflow. It's, I think, a lot easier than working with icon fonts. And I got used to do this whole showdown with icon fonts. I'm not even doing it anymore. Icon fonts are stupid. This is awesome. End of story. Uh, <laughs> um, this is how you test for SVG support, inline SVG support. Don't even worry about it, but it like makes, you know, I'm sure people are like, yeah, duh, I get it. But it, if you don't know, it makes a div, it injects some SVG in there and checks if its namespace is correct. That's a true-false situation. It will turn either true or false, true if the browser supports 
SVG and false if it doesn't, which allows us to write some logic like this. If the browser supports SVG, cool, do stuff. In this case, we're going to end up Ajaxing for that file we just made. Otherwise, we're going to need to do something else for fallbacks if you care, if you're in a position where you need to care. If you don't care, forget it. Just, just Ajax for the file without this logic. Uh, that's a modern uh, uh, Ajax request if you don't need to care about older browsers and stuff, which you do or you don't, but it'll just grab that file and it just drops it in the document. So you have this HTML document, you want to use the icons all over it, just trigger an Ajax request, do it async, do it however you want to do it you know, for, for performance and for your site's loading capabilities. Ajax for the file and then this just drops it in the document so it's ready to go, so it's ready to reference the things. The reason we have to do this is basically because IE. Like, you should be able to use a use element and then put the full file path to the SVG defs file right in there and it will just go grab the icon that it needs and put it there. It doesn't work in Edge, nothing. It doesn't work in anywhere in IE land. So we do this instead. It's not that big of a deal. The browser would have to make the request for the file anyway. So it's like, well, now do it with Ajax, whatever. You know, it's, it's kind of a horse apiece. Uh, cool. So for the fallback situation, there is a thing called Grunticon. It does a great job at uh, 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 SVG fallback kind of stuff, so you can use it instead. I'm going to blast through it because it's like, you, you know, just look at the Grunticon docs is the point, really. But it's like you put a class name on the SVG, and then in the false situation, like it's not supported, then call the Grunticon thing. But Grunticon deals with the success situation, too, so just remove that, and the Grunticon will do the fallbacks. It ends up working in all the browsers you expect it to and working in uh, things where in uh, uh, inline SVG doesn't work, like old Android and old IEs and stuff. These are PNGs that Grunticon has created for you. So it's a great fallback uh, tool. So yeah, and what's kind of cool about doing it this way is that one day when you stop caring about fallbacks for other browsers, you just pull that out. Just pull Grunticon out, and it's then you're, you're kind of modernized. You're not reliant on uh, a polyfill forever. Have you heard of the Noun Project? It's pretty sweet. There's just, you just type anything and there's a great icon for it. It works great for this icon flow kind of thing. Uh, they have a Mac app that's fairly new that's pretty nice. It's just this tiny little thing. You type stuff in it. I have Illustrator. I just dragged and dropped and boom, I have an eyeball. You know, it's like you need, you need icons and you need them quick or any kind of SVG vector version of things. Just search, you get them, you drag and drop them. It's like the future. Anyway, that's Sketch, works great with Sketch. Anyway, Noun Project is sweet. Crop it, save it out, .svg, it's part of your system. Love it. What if you do all this? What do you get out of that? How do you, what is, the, what is, what is in it for you? Uh, all your icons are vector, that's pretty great. You don't have to worry about the, you know, the, the different screen sizes and all that stuff. They're gonna look great forever. Uh, and, uh, as opposed to some of the other systems, uh, you can be multicolor. It could be a cabin with green trim and white smoke or whatever, no problem. You can draw anything you can draw on SVG can be used in this system. You can make the smoke animate or the door open or whatever. Just because it's in the DOM, any CSS animation you apply, you can just do whatever you want that way, it's great. Uh, you can script stuff. You can have, I want to, when I click on the smoke, it gets smokier. I don't know, do whatever you can in JavaScript. Uh, it has better accessibility because, you know, you tab to the icon and it announces what it is, or it doesn't do that, or you kind of have control over it. With icon fonts, you really have to jump through hoops to get that to work. Semantically, it makes more sense. You're using SVG, which is semantically an image, which is what it is on the page. You don't have to fake that garbage. And there's so many build tools and cool processes for it. You just get a whole lot. I feel like that adds up to one big fat rainbow of awesome. These are some, uh, 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 once they're in the DOM, let's say these were all our icons. They're, they have some class names applied to them, because why not? Now that they're in the DOM, I can just be like, oh, I'm just going to change the fill color, and they all kind of change. You know, I'm just using the web inspector to, because I'm styling them through CSS. I can change the fills and all, all that stuff Leah was doing with strokes and making that all happen through CSS. That's inline SVG with CSS. It's the same thing that's going on here. Uh, SVG has some pretty cool animation tools. We'll just kind of go through real quick, except for Smile, because that's kind of gone, so let's just stop talking about it, I guess. RIP, R-I-P. Uh, and uh, yeah, CSS is one of them that we already kind of covered. This is a little robot guy. He's floating around, real cute. I mess with him for a while in this video. I'm like, your arm, buddy, gone. Got <laughs> Don't have it. 
<laughs> these are our design patterns page on CodePen. These aren't animations, but just transitions. When your mouse goes over it, there's a hover state, and I just move things around with, uh, just translate it up, or change scale, or change fill, you know, and apply transitions to them. That's all just inline SVG that draws that stuff, really simple things you can do. JavaScript, of course, can animate stuff. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this, but it's like JavaScript can do anything, right? So here's just a really simple loop where we move the, the position of a circle by, by 10 every 20 milliseconds. That's not, like not how you would do it these days. It would be like request animation frame and stuff, but more likely you'd use a library like Snap SVG. It's kind of like jQuery for SVG. It's really nice syntax. GreenSock is really powerful for animating anything, including SVG does a great job with. I think we're going to hear from Sarah a little later on that, 4 o'clock, I think. Um, SVG DS, D, D3 does a lot of data stuff. You've probably seen it. Here's just some, here's some syntax of how Snap SVG looks and how kind of like it does the chaining and stuff that you may be familiar with from the jQuery days, I think we're calling them now, back then. Hey, <laughs> here's just the syntax of work. I'm just moving the clouds across the screen. It's kind of performant and nice. MailChimp uses it to high five you when you send a campaign, which is pretty fun. Uh, Chris Gannon does really great stuff on with GreenSock on CodePen, little fun animations like that that kind of draw themselves and spin around. Here's a nice one from, from him. Uh, yeah, swinging stuff, all kinds of stuff. It's all timelined out with GreenSock, which is pretty good. They have a nice API for that. I'm not going to take the stuff away, but you also should check out Sarah Drasner's uh, portfolio on CodePen, or I don't know what we call them, <laughs> profiles, I guess. She has a zillion excellent SVG animations. We're going to see some of these later, I think. This is a really particularly beautiful one, I think. Uh, SVG has this concept of filters in it, which is pretty great. Uh, uh, which we're not, I'm not, I used to do this visual explanation of it, but we're going we're gonna to cruise because time is going, look at the goo happening. That's when blur and contrast fight each other. It's so cool because blur is contrast's only natural enemy. <laughs> you can draw stuff in SVG. Look at that. You just do that with, where you just animate the, like, like the, the uh, uh, dash offset or whatever. That's just, that's the trick. That's one dash that's as long as the whole thing is. So if you animate it the length of itself, it draws itself. Pretty cool. So charting is pretty good in SVG. I just want to kind of get to the end because we got more stuff to learn. Uh, it's good for maps. It's good. For, look at look at clipping and masking. Oh, nice. It's just because that the bones is above it, but it's only showing this circle of it. And it's following the mouse, which is pretty great. That works with the clip path element, which is uh, it's which is different than masking. Clipping is vector. Masks are raster. Or they, at least they can be. I want to get to this fun ending quote here. Scott Gell said that you know there's database people, and we kind of refer to them as architects. JavaScript people are always engineers, of course, but SVG people are archaeologists because it's freaking old. It's kind of like discover, we kind of discover, like, cool, one cackle, that's cool. <laughs> and then, yeah, I have this list of uh, every SVG thing that's kind of ever been done. So anyway, uh, I'll make the slides available. Thanks for listening very much to my talk. <laughs> <laughs>